the first thing I noticed was, where are all the laptops? <laughs> yeah, so believe it or not, this is actually somewhat realistic. <laughs> there it is. Hey guys, welcome back to our channel. I'm Em. And I'm Lloyd. And we're two former corporate lawyers based in Hong Kong. So we keep hearing about this new legal drama on Netflix, Partner Track, which we actually haven't seen yet. So today we're going to be watching and reacting to episode one. The show follows an Asian American lawyer as she navigates her career in M&A law in New York City. I'm personally really excited to watch this because I actually used to work in M&A specifically. So without further ado, let's get right into it. It's simple. If you want to accelerate, you need more force. I love laws, in physics and in life. So I became a lawyer. And why mergers and acquisitions? Because I've always wanted to be the best. The toughest, smartest corporate lawyers do M&A. Is that something you agree with? <laughs> I mean, I definitely think there is some truth to that. I think a lot of people that enter the workforce as lawyers do tend to like the idea of doing M&A. I think it's the perception that you're closer to the business and commercial side of things and you're working on deals that are often perceived as being quite sexy in the sense that sometimes M&A deals go into newspapers like the Financial Times and otherwise get reported on so they can seem really high profile. That said, I do think that at the end of the day, it is really just a job like any other. And while the deals might be a little bit more exciting from time to time, it does depend on a lot of things. And I also think it's important to keep in mind that it's very hard to generalize practice areas like this across the board because your experience in a certain practice area is going to depend a lot on the city you work in, the firm, the team, your specific boss. So I think that's good to keep in mind when you're thinking about what kind of practice areas you'd like to work in. Yeah, and I think that personality type is also a big thing. I think certain people with different preferences in terms of what they like to do and their working style tend to find different teams that kind of make sense for them. So it's not to say that in every case, the brightest and best lawyers end up in M&A for whatever reason. I need a new case, staff. What? I just brought the Wayland deal. I need a staff ASAP. You have seriously worked nonstop for six years. It's in the back. M&A is only promoting two, maybe three junior partners this year. Right, you, Dan, and Todd. Maybe we're neck and neck. Oh. Look, I just need one more heavyweight to lock it in. You're not gonna lose junior partner just because you're not staff for one day. So what they're both talking about here is just how much work they have on their plates. So typically how it looks for M&A lawyers is that you'll be busy when you're on active matters or active transactions. And sometimes you can be doing multiple transactions at a time. So you'll be pretty busy during those periods. Typically, the normal ebb and flow is you're on a deal and after you're off a deal, you usually have a couple of days or even a couple of weeks at times where you don't really have that much going on. You're working on ad hoc things and it can give you a chance to really rest up and recuperate. On the flip side, if you're looking to get staffed on a deal right after another one has completed, then you're not really getting that period in between where you can rest up and recover, which can make sense if you're gunning for partnership or if you're just really, really keen. But typically people aren't looking for work that aggressively in my experience. And speaking of partnership, it seems like the show is implying that Ingrid is up for partnership after working as a lawyer for only six years, which in practice is actually very, very unusual, especially at big law firms. Typically at big law firms, you're looking at a timeline of working for at least 10 years before making partners, so this part is not so realistic. I want this deal, I'm your guy. Tyler, we all want you on this case, but we need a reason to take Gavin off. Okay, hey, look, not only have I just pitched six new clients, I started reading Vogue, Teen Vogue and Women's Wear Daily when I was 11. I know Alexander McQueen didn't know Couture until he went to Givenchy, and unlike Gavin Dunmore, I actually know the difference between polyester and wool. Fine, it's yours. You won't be sorry. So this isn't super realistic. It's not really common for people to call a partner and talk about trying to get someone off a deal so that they can get on it. Typically speaking, if you're on a deal from the beginning, you won't really be taken off just because you have a lot of context on that deal already from attending calls and reading in and basically understanding what the client is looking for. So to get someone else caught up to speed can take a lot of time and money in the case of the client. And it's not something that's usually done. In this case, the guy seems to have some industry knowledge in the sense that he understands textiles and fashion, but I don't think that's really enough to usually take someone off a deal, and it's curious why he wouldn't be put on it in the first place. I would say the same goes for litigation generally as well. Once you get started working on a case, it's quite unlikely that you'll suddenly be taken off, especially for these types of reasons, unless there's some really exceptional circumstance. Uh, 
God. I'm, I'm Caleb Sanders. I'm a first year here at Parsons. I am really excited to be here. <laughs> May I ask you a question? Don't fucking ask permission to ask a question. Just ask the fucking question. <laughs> of course. Um, so, in intellectual property law, we studied the Lexi and Huntsman case. <laughs> and, well, how you handled the patent issues was brilliant. And I, stop, I was just... Stop talking. Sanders, right? No one's buying your wide-eyed ingenue act. It's manipulative and a cliche. <laughs> and stop laughing. That's making me mad. Laughter is a coward's expression of fear. <laughs> Bye. Okay, while this is obviously quite exaggerated, it's not totally inaccurate. It's not unusual, I think, to get newcomers acting this way when they first join a firm. And it's also not unusual for that kind of behavior to get this type of response, whether or not people openly show it as the partner has in this case. Yeah, so believe it or not, this is actually somewhat realistic because from time to time you do see someone that comes in at a really junior level, either an intern or a first year, and they're really just super keen and laying it on super thick. Are you available, Fallon? Willing and able. Excellent. I can draft up a quick and dirty NDA, get that signed ASAP. Great, Jan. So, Fallon, I want you to sit in on the kickoff this afternoon. Ted Lasseter, Suncorp CEO, is coming at 3 o'clock. Love to. Great. I just worked on an oil and gas client last year. Chevron divested its holdings in Mexico's Real Oil, so I know all about family-owned energy and all those tricky regulatory issues. Great. Yes, Jan, you sit in on the kickoff as well. Make sure we're ready to go at 3 o'clock. So this is definitely a thing. A lot of people like to get involved with the deal right from the beginning. So if you are asked to join in the kickoff call, there's a really good chance that you'll be staffed on that transaction going forward. And this is kind of for the same reason that we mentioned before, where basically if you're involved in the deal from the beginning, it's less likely you'll be taken off and you kind of have full context for everything the client's asking for. So you're kind of up to speed at every stage of the deal. Well, shoot. <laughs> Ingrid Young, I'm the senior associate on the deal. It's great to meet you, Ted. Ted Lasseter. No hard feelings, I hope. You just don't look a day over 18 to me. You folks are lucky that way, right? <laughs> this is my uh, general counsel. That's Mark Trainer. So unfortunately, this part is also kind of realistic. I think it's not uncommon that if you're a young female, sometimes you get these sort of off-color, awkward remarks. And it does put you in quite a weird position, especially if it's coming from the client because they're the client frequently. You don't feel like you can really do much more than Ingrid does in this scenario, which is brush it off and move on. So, what's happening with our top execs? Most of them are parachuting out, but we are mainly interested in keeping Jack Barstow on. Franklin right. Min's right-hand man. That's right. Barstow spent the past three years slaving away to get their offshore drilling ops up and running, and now he learns old man Min's looking to sell? I bet he's pissed. Barstow was seen meeting with Ken Fox of Chevron on Monday. If you want Barstow, we definitely need a key man provision. What'd I tell you, Ted? the best and the brightest. So there are a couple things that are being mentioned here that are actually super realistic. The first is a parachute, which can refer to a golden parachute, which is basically a provision that some executives or key management people have in their contracts, whereby if the company is sold, they have the option to take a really big payout and leave their job. The second thing is the key man provision, which is something that's actually pretty common in deals. Normally when a buyer wants to buy a company, they want to make sure that certain people in key management are still there because the company is not really worth much or the expertise is kind of lost with the people if they leave the company upon sale. So basically by putting in a key man provision, you're basically including terms in the contract to say that after the sale takes place, certain people have to stay engaged with the company for a certain amount of time to make sure that value is still preserved. Sorry, back to the salt mines. Hey, uh, so, so I, I know their free will is just an illusion, but what are you doing Friday? Hopefully not babysitting my paralegal. I'm going to a thing at the plaza. Would you like to join me? Yes, I'd love to. <laughs> Great. So this is actually the first thing that's probably actually kind of unrealistic in terms of the experience of working as a lawyer, which is that you probably wouldn't sign up for Friday plans if you just got staffed on a new transaction. I want all the phase one and phase two reports. The full set, not abridged. The IP agreements and the lease and wall docs too. Aren't you writing this down? Okay, so this part is definitely accurate. As we've talked about on this channel before, when you're receiving instructions, always write them down. You shouldn't assume that you'll be able to remember everything that someone tells you, and a lot of the times you don't even know how detailed the instructions will be until you get there. Ingrid, uh, hi. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't make it tomorrow. <laughs> there it is. You gotta, 
You gotta cancel your plans because you can't make them. It's just, it, it, people don't make plans to begin with, just specifically for this reason. It's just part of the job, and if you start off doing this, you'll quickly learn not to continue doing yeah. this because you'll keep having to cancel your plans. Ted, Mark brought me up to speed about your budgetary concerns. Mm -hmm. I had two senior associates on the matter to make sure we were steering the ship in the right direction. But going forward, we will keep just one. Much appreciated, Marty. So. Hmm. And speaking of regulatory, my buddy Winston is actually at the Department of Energy in fossil fuels. Winston and I were in the speed together. He's a very good friend, and it never hurts to have a friendly face at the DOE. Well, that could be very valuable indeed. Of course, that would all have to be official. Of course. Okay, I think it makes sense to have Dan stay on and run point. Thank you, Young. So this is both realistic and slightly unrealistic. It is realistic that clients will sometimes have budgetary concerns and need to take people off a matter or raise concerns about how a deal is staffed. This always really depends on the client though. Some clients really don't care. And I've worked on deals where the other side has several partners, several senior associates and several associates all working on the same file. Whereas on our side, we've had maybe one partner, a senior associate, myself as a junior associate and a trainee. What's a bit unrealistic though, is that you wouldn't have the partner with the client there running a sort of interview process to figure out who stays on the file. Usually the partner would just make a call, let the person know, hey, the client has a budgetary concern, so we'll take you off this matter and let the other person proceed. And that would be that. Worked for his dad before I went to the Department of Energy. Winston, Department of, do you know Dan Fallon? Dan's my man. He's on fire with this Suncorp deal. You know about it. All 2.9 billion of it. He knew the purchase price. If that gets out before the term sheet signed, he was drunk. Maybe it won't come out. But if it leaks, there won't be a deal. At least not for Parsons. So what looks like is happening here is that there's a competitive bid process for buying this company, Min. Usually what happens in a bid process is that anyone interested in buying the company can submit an offer with the purchase price to how much they want to buy the company for. The seller then kind of looks at all of the offers they've received and picks the best one or the best couple and will proceed those into the next stage of the negotiations. So in this case, it's really not good for the buyer if the purchase price is leaked because then everyone will kind of know that they just need to beat that price to have a more competitive offer in the bid process. And if that happens, the lawyers don't really have any work to do. I've worked on competitive bid deals where our clients have put in a bid to buy a company, but the offer price wasn't high enough. So the deal kind of ended for us right then and there. Whereas if our clients had won the bid, then we'd have more work to do in drafting the documents and finalizing the transaction. We have to get this term sheet signed before the article comes out. So for the next 60 hours, you're mine. Let's get to work. So $2.9 billion. So obviously a little bit dramatized, but the one unrealistic thing about this scene is that you wouldn't have a room without a laptop in it. I mean, people would be working <laughs> on drafting. So there would be at least one, I mean, everybody would probably have a laptop out and not all the documents would necessarily be printed out in hard copy. Sometimes people are looking at things in a data room that's virtual. So you'd be looking at things on your computer, but to be honest, like the paper's not unrealistic. The fact that there's no computers is super unrealistic. The first thing I noticed was where are all the laptops? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for helping expedite the process this weekend. You remember my sons, Carter, Min's General Counsel, and Z. Shall we? Well, what did I tell you? Best and the brightest. Mm -hmm. Young will run point and close the deal. That work for you? Sure, why the hell not? Good, we'll get into due diligence and bring this baby home. So just in terms of the process, to give a bit more color into what this actually looks like, what they've signed now is the term sheet, which basically just has the high level terms of the transaction, including the price and maybe some contractual things that they want to include. And then they're moving into due diligence. So down the line, they'll have to draft a share purchase agreement and maybe a shareholders agreement to govern the sale and purchase of the shares in the company. And if there are any red flags that come out during due diligence, those will be addressed in the share purchase agreement. So altogether, pretty realistic depiction of what it's like to be a lawyer. Obviously dramatized at parts because it is a TV show at the end of the day, but in terms of process and what M&A work actually looks like, they did a pretty good job. Actually, I'm pleasantly surprised. Yeah. The depiction of workplace politics in this show is actually also pretty accurate. Of course, it's a bit dramatized at times because this is a TV show, but 
I think it actually quite accurately shows how a lot of times politics and the relationships between people are quite nuanced and it's not a lot of overt fighting like sometimes you see in other TV shows about lawyers. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like and let us know in the comments if you'd like to see us react to more episodes of Partner Track. It definitely exceeded our expectations.